marathon basketball over the past two weeks, you might think you're seeing double, but it's not an illusion. See for yourself next on the NCAA Today. Everybody. I'm Ron Franklin, and this is the NCAA Today on ESPN. I'm standing just outside the Hoosier Dome here in Indianapolis, where the Duke Blue Devils have just captured their first national championship under head coach Mike Krzyzewski. Four straight trips here, in fact, five in the last six years for Michael. And in case you've been off the planet someplace, let's go back and take a look at the highlights. This is how it all unfolded. I tell you what, Kansas, they're warming up right in front of me. They were really ready to play. I mean, I knew watching those kids warm up, and I watched our kids warm up, and I told my staff, I said, this is going to be a hell of a game. I said, I hope we have enough for 40 minutes. Establishing ourselves early in the game is what we love to do, and um, that gives us a whole lot of confidence when we could come out there and get a lead. And, uh, you know, that's what I thought about a lot before the game, just making sure that I was ready and trying to get the rest of the guys ready so as soon as we stepped out on the floor we were ready to go and we were going to jump on them early. Look at this play. I've never seen the basket seem like it had a lid on it for Kansas like it did tonight. I felt like we had so so many good shots around the hoop that just didn't fall in. I think our last possession was truly indicative of the entire game. We miss a layup and get the rebound, tap it, put it, I mean, get the rebound, put it back up, miss it, tap it, miss it. And then all of a sudden it goes out of bounds off the bus. And there's eight seconds left to play. We didn't come out and attack like we wanted to from the very start. We kind of just, uh, we were kind of in a lull there. We were we were settling for some, you know, outside shots. We were, we were getting some good shots. We just weren't hitting them. I mean, I don't know what our percentage was in the first half, but we had a lot of shots, and I can remember a lot of tips and taps and second shots we got that we still couldn't put down. You know, everyone dreamed, especially last year, you know, you always see those highlight clips of Jordan hitting the last second shot, and you want to play a big role. So um, I think everyone dreamed about it. I don't know if I was a star, but you know, I was very happy that I could be a star. All right, well, it feels good, you know. It's great. I, I didn't expect it. I just wanted to come in and do the best I could, and uh, I'm glad it worked out. I'm one of those old-fashioned guys. I think you can learn so much from college athletics. And I think that what you saw out there tonight was two teams full of true student athletes. I think so much time is spent talking and so much time is spent writing about the bad things in sport. And I think what you saw out there tonight was some good things. I'm just really happy for my team. Did you see their faces, you know, when you, when you went? Jeez, I felt so good. I looked at my kids, my girls, my three daughters. You see him crying and all that. That makes me feel good. Uh, so that's the way it is. I hope we do it again. Wonder when we'll do it again. Giving a really big trophy to coach that he can carry home to Duke. Giving the rest of my coaching staff, the rest of our coaching staff, national championship, people in Durham, the people at Duke, all the fans, all the people that follow us. Because uh, that's what we're in it for. We're in it for uh, the team and for everyone, not just personally. The women's Division I championship was played down in beautiful old New Orleans this past weekend. What a great place for such a great game. Here's a recap with Jim Gallagher. Revenge can be sweet, especially if you're the Tennessee Lady Vols. Last year, Virginia won in overtime of the East Regional, costing Tennessee a trip to the Final Four. And early on, it looked like Virginia was going to do it again. Behind player of the year, Don Staley, they opened up a 10-point lead. Tennessee still led by one at the half, though. Opened it up in the second half, thanks to the bruising inside play of Deidre Charles. Seemed like they didn't have anybody who could stop you inside. Well, my coach always told me, once I put my mind to doing something, they can't nobody stop me, and I just let that build up inside of me and took it on. Charles finished with 19, but Virginia battled back. Tanya Cordoza drives the lane and gives Virginia a four-point lead. But enter Dina Head, 
down by two, she nailed both free throws to tie the game at 60. I went up to the free throw line with confidence, and I think the rest of our team went up to that free throw line and did the same thing. Staley's last second shot didn't go. We went to overtime at 60 apiece. I thought when we went into overtime, the team had confidence. Just like last year, I thought Virginia went to their huddle, and they, they had that same attitude. Overtime was simply a free throw shooting contest. Virginia missed the front end of 3-1-1, one one, while Tennessee's Dean ahead hit five free throws in overtime to ice it for the Lady Vols. They won at 70-67 to 67 the final. The first was nice and sweet. Win it in 89 when we weren't supposed to was good. This was special because of last year and all the adversity. You hope that they step to the line and, and knock them down, and today they didn't. Most of the time when we are in close situations, the two players that missed the foul shots tonight normally make them. From our coach's perspective, they're trying to keep our heads high. Uh, you know, we're caught up in emotion right now. Uh, the season wasn't a total failure. Failure. We had a, a great team, a great bunch of people working together, and uh, you know, this, this gives us a little more incentive for next year. So Tennessee takes it, and they become the first team in NCAA history to ever win three women's championships. Coming up next on the NCAA Today, you'll meet the Virginia Twins, and we'll show you a rags-to-riches swimmer from the University of Texas. We'll drop in on the men's Division I hockey championships, and we'll show you what it took to put on a Final Four here in Indianapolis. We'll be right back. To order your copy of the official 1991 Final Four program, send $8 to 1991 Final Four program, 904 North Broadway, Lexington, Kentucky. 40505. The NCAA Today is brought to you by Pizza Hut, making it great, and by Gillette, makers of Right Guard Sports Stick. On this week's Leg Sure Energy Spotlight, we'd like to introduce you to Heidi and Heather Burge. Now, for people that have to play them in the University of Virginia basketball team, they say it's sort of like playing against the tall buildings here in downtown Indianapolis. Surely you've seen them playing down there in the middle, banging shoulders with other tall basketball players. Heather and Heidi Burge are the world's tallest identical twins, a distinction that has its rewards and its penalties. When I walk by, they just go, you know, whoa, she's so tall. And, and then they see my twin walking what, right after me, and they, you know, they don't know what to say. <laughs> they try, I mean, I don't think they try to hide it after that. They're just like, the, either they come up and ask you how tall you are, or do you play basketball, or, you know, but I'm just used to it. It's, it's nothing that bothers me too much. Having each other as a standard, as my dad said once, is, is such a benefit that people don't realize. You know, I think that there might have been a problem maybe socially if there was only just one of us and i think we've we've adjusted better and quick and more quickly because uh, there are two of us and and i think we've had a little more fun also because we're twins and the attention that we get is kind of fun the real fun their friends and teammates say is just being around them when they play together and when they're just being sisters together the biggest thing is that we're, we're each each other's best competitor and so whenever we're, we're on the court and pushing in and shoving people t we take it personally and, and and we bring out the sisterhood between us i guess and and we start you know either talking or, or hitting <laughs> and debbie yeah she has to control us sometimes indeed coach debbie ryan may have her hands full with the two sophomores but as you might expect she doesn't complain especially since they accounted for more than 550 points and 347 rebounds during Virginia's regular season. Our coaching staff has really done a, a, a great job. They've made a, a good effort to separate us completely, look at us as two different individ individuals and with two different separate, you know, separate games, separate personalities, and, and a few things they can use in our appearance to <laughs> tell us apart. And apart is how they're spending this semester, living apart for the first time ever. Both say they're enjoying the learning experience, both about themselves and the world around them, which is why they chose Virginia. Education was their primary objective in choosing a school. That, plus the opportunity to play a little basketball. 
Coach Ryan didn't recruit the Burgess very strongly out of Palos Verdes State's High School in California. She thought Virginia might be a bit too far from home. But you get the feeling talking to Heidi and Heather Burge that home is not that far away wherever they are. We have agreed that we we're going to have as much fun as, with it as we can with all the looks, with all, all the, the press and things like that and the intention that um, we're just going to, you know, just have fun with it and enjoy it because it's a once-in-a-life experience and, I don't know, I think it's great <laughs> sometimes. To be totally fair, these interviews don't begin to tell the story of the Burge twins. They are as comfortable with their celebrity on and off the court as they are with each other. And to be totally, totally fair, in doing this story, we did one more interview with Heidi. So here's a parting shot from Heather. Well, the, what, are you, what are you asking? I'm sorry. As unique as they are, Heather and Heidi Burge are not the only set of twins playing women's college basketball. In fact, they're not even the only Heidi and Heather duo. There's the Tungle sisters. That's Heidi on the left and Heather on the right, both of whom play for Eastern Washington University. Seen double yet? Well, how about Chrissy and Jenny Kuzinski from North Carolina State? Or Sandy and Susan Nice from Montana State? That's Sandy on the left. Kim and Karen Saluski play for the University of Toledo. At last count, there were seven sets of twins playing women's collegiate basketball, five on the same teams. We'll be back with more on the NCAA Today after this. Some say that the great attraction to sports is the opportunity to excel. And while most of us do so only in our dreams, a young man from the University of Texas took it to its pinnacle, an Olympic gold medal. And oddly enough, prior to that, no one had ever heard of him. In high school, he was all but forgotten. But in college, he has been unforgettable. Sean Jordan of the University of Texas has become one of the top sprinters in the nation, but he has not always swam in the fast lane. Sean Jordan did not make a big splash in high school. He was not heavily recruited, but that did not keep him from winning a gold medal at the last Olympics. And I was determined coming out of high school to prove to people that, you know, I, I can swim, and I can swim faster than anyone thinks I can. And so it was kind of a challenge. It was, uh, I wanted to show myself and others that, you know, hey, I can stand up on the blocks and, and race people. He was our Kmart Blue Light Special. Which, which we liked. And two and a quarter years later, he made the Olympic team, which I would have bet a house and a daughter on he wouldn't have made. Jordan went to high school at Dallas Highland Park. His senior season, he finished third in the state championships, and he caught the eye of Longhorn swim coach Eddie Reese. After a redshirt season at Texas, Jordan came out of nowhere to qualify for the 1988 Olympic team by three hundredths of a second. He went with Matt Biondi and the rest of the U.S. team to Seoul, South Korea, and Jordan won a gold medal as part of the 400-meter freestyle relay. I was definitely a long shot as far as anyone else was concerned. It gave me a lot of confidence, uh, confidence that I didn't have before Olympic trials. I felt that I could stand up and race with the best, and uh, so it helped me a lot in my collegiate career the, next, the following three years. Sean's a team leader. He swims really fast, and we all look up to him, and as, as well as being a uh, fast swimmer, he's also a pretty nice guy and a good friend. He, uh, he knows how to communicate with people, and he's pretty outspoken, and he shows how much a leader he is in and out of the water. He has won national individual championships and national team titles. Jordan has just finished his eligibility at Texas, but he has not closed out his swimming career. Jordan will continue working toward the next Olympics, 1992 in Barcelona. He will go for the gold one more time. Well, I think he definitely should make the team. I mean, he made it in 88, and he's a lot better now. So uh, I think, you know, and he has a good chance to win the gold medal. He had a great summer last year, and uh, he'll probably be better in 92. He kind of stands for what the program is because we like people to come in and to improve a lot. We don't, we don't aim to win the NCAAs. 
that's in the back of our mind. But all I want people to do is get faster. And I'd like them to get faster than they can believe. But in particularly, I'd like them to get faster than all their friends can believe. That's what Sean has done. Because anybody that knew him in high school would know that there's no way he could ever be this good. Olympic trials is, is my next goal. And there's no gifts here. If, if you have a bad day, you fall sick on that particular day, it's game over. And I'm watching, you know, on NBC. But I, I'm, I'm trying to, to, you know, keep a good attitude, stay focused. And uh, Barcelona will take care of itself if I take care of myself. John Jordan, he was overlooked in high school. But look out for him in next year's Olympics. For the NCAA Today, Danny Elson, Austin, Texas. If you have any story ideas pertaining to college athletics, write us. We want to hear about your ideas for the NCAA today. They don't play much ice hockey in the city of Austin, Texas, but they do in St. Paul, Minnesota, which is where the NCAA today went to cover this year's men's division one ice hockey championships boston university came into the championship game with a team that was virtually the same as the one that lost to colgate in last year's semifinal round last year we're just you know happy to be there surprised and in awe of the whole thing the whole process this year you know most of us have been there uh last year so we'll go there and uh we're looking to you know, not only just win one game or you know do good we're we're going there to uh, win two games in a row. There's no question that uh, the attitude is different. It's almost as if, hey, you know, we, we really wanted to really try to get here this year. And they told us we should be here this year. Well, we're here. Let's do something with it. Whereas last year, we were pinching ourselves. Uh, do we really do this? So it's a completely different feeling, that's for sure. But certainly the guys will be uh, as focused as you have to be, I think. And that focus certainly was to give the Terriers their fourth national title in 17 Final Four appearances. But Northern Michigan had other ideas. It didn't bring much experience, but it did bring the Western Hockey Association's most valuable player, Scott Beatty. Well, remember, there's 20 guys out on the ice all the time, and I think they're the ones doing the work. You know, puck just happens to win for me once in a while, and, but you got to remember who I play with, and Ben's a good team, and Jim's a big, tough guy, and get the puck out of the corner. And it's pretty easy for me to stand in front of the net and put it in when those guys do all the work. And Scotty's just one of those guys that has a knack for the puck, a knack for the net. He, he usually gets five or six good opportunities every night that he plays, and when he's sharp, you're not going to stop him. Boston's Ed Ronan set the tempo for what would turn out to be one of the most exciting championship games in NCAA history, not to mention one of the longest. And Boston University strikes at the one-minute mark. Ed Ronan! With just one minute gone in the first period, Ronan went 60 feet uncontested to slap one by goalie Bill Pye. Boston scored twice more in the period, on goals by David Sacco and another by Ronan. Northern Michigan got untracked in a big way in the second period. Eventually, rattled off six straight goals before the Terriers answered in the third. Northern Michigan's Dean Antos, who had an outstanding game, was the first to score for NMU. Down by three with just over six minutes left to play, Boston coach Jack Parker rallied his charges for a miracle finish. It came with just 39 seconds left in regulation when Scott LeChance passed to David Sacco in front of the goal for the score that sent it into the first overtime, 7-all. Time, but just by score, LeChance. LeChance gets it over the score! Two overtimes later, the score was still nodded, despite outstanding play on both sides. With less than two minutes in the third sudden death overtime, it was time for a hero. And Northern Michigan's Daryl Plandowski stepped up to take the shot that gave the win to the Wildcats. The 
The NCAA Today is brought to you in part by Rawlings, official championship basketball for the NCAA, and by Haynes Her Way. My way is Haynes Her Way. You know, it could be argued that the men's Final Four has now become a bigger event than the Super Bowl. Well, we're not going to argue that point, but you could tell just the vastness of this room right here, which is the interview room at this year's Final Four, that this thing has become huge. We thought we'd take you behind the scenes to give you a better idea of what happens with some of the committees to make sure that this event lives up to its billing. Sometimes that intention gets lost in all the attention, but it hasn't always been that way. As a result of a really, a, a, it almost became six or seven months of, a, of intense coverage on Bird Johnson that uh, from a media point of view that uh, uh, it made a big difference in, uh, in the future of media coverage for the event. Of course, one of the big decisions is where to stage the event, which in itself generates controversy. The tournament will be generating over, I think, 150 to $60 million this year, and the difference in income if we were to go to a conventional building in a dome in terms of ticket sales really represents a half of 1%, which is a very uh, minimal amount of dollars. So it's not a financial consideration when it comes to selecting the Final Four side, but it's really a sincere effort on behalf of the men's basketball committee to accommodate as many basketball fans from across the country as we possibly can. Besides, what university could accommodate just the press corps, let alone the demand for tickets? It takes a full-time staff of five at the NCAA headquarters just to keep track of all the arrangements throughout the year. Come tournament time, though, thousands of volunteers and contracted workers put it all together in just a matter of days, including a press room that could swallow four basketball courts. Of course, once you've decided where to play, you have to decide who's going to play. I think that uh, in recent years especially that the, uh, there's more parity than there's ever been, and, and uh, I like to think too that with that parity that uh, that doesn't mean that the top teams have been uh, brought down to, to a lesser level, I think that more teams have been brought up to a, a higher level of play. Everything was at a higher level at this year's Final Four. And can you honestly say that any of the four don't deserve to be called champion? The teams are uh, getting better. The players are jumping higher. They're running faster. They're shooting better. And uh, the coaching has improved. And uh, uh, the officiating is, uh, is better. And uh, as I look to all aspects of it, I, all I see is improvement. Well, I think we've had a great tournament to date, competitive games, uh, well attended, good TV ratings, and um, you know, I'm, I'm pleased with the tournament. The uh, sites have done a wonderful job in managing the event. The staff has done a great job in keeping the committee up to date on uh, what we ought to be doing, and um, you know, I think we're going to have a great Final Four here in Indianapolis. Well, it's time to say so long for the great state of Indiana. As usual, Hoosier hospitality has been simply magnificent, and we greatly appreciate it. Join us next week on the show as we'll profile some of the nation's top women gymnasts. Also, we're going to take you on a tour of the new visitor center at the NCAA in Kansas City. And we'll show you one of the most unique sports stories of the year as ace pitcher Nolan Ryan will square off against his son, Reed, in an exhibition baseball game between the Texas Rangers and the University of Texas down in Austin. For the NCAA Today, I'm Ron Franklin.